Welcome to the session. So we're going to start a, a bit late now, but uh, yeah, um, we begin with uh, Tim Möbus, who is going to talk about bosonic Hamiltonian learning via new information propagation bounds. So Tim, please, the floor is yours. Okay, um, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, okay, so as Daniel already said, uh, today I will talk about a project with, um, okay, with Andreas Blum and Matthias Caro, um, who are at this conference as well, in, in the room as well, so they, he can support me or he, they can answer the question. And it's also with Albert Werner and Camille Soussi. So, okay, um, um, first of all, I know it's working. Okay, um, first of all, um, I will talk a little bit about the motivations so or the task we are trying to solve here. And then I will give um, our bosonic um, algorithm, algorithm, which solves the problem. And then finally, I give some, some ideas which we use to construct the estimator in the, in the somehow not working problem. Um, okay. Um, I will give some ideas um, for uh, which we use um, for the estimator in the algorithm or the protocol. And then at the end, I will give the final result. So um, let's start with the task we are trying to solve here. So we kind of have a black, black box and we want to um, gather information from it. And this is the black box is a time evolution and we have some product input states um, as I said, it's a time evolution, so we can um, um, get a state back from this black, black box after some time t, which can be changed. And then at the end, we are allowed to measure the output state. And from this output state and the measurements, we get some data. And by post-processing, we want to learn about this box, about this time evolution. So in, um, we want to learn the coefficients of the Hamiltonian which defines the time evolution. And of course, we also need some structure in the Hamiltonian. So we have a many body system here. So we have, for example, nearest neighbors. And okay. So, okay. So the task is to learn the defining coefficients in the Hamiltonian um, up to a position epsilon and under some probability assumptions. So, and these assumptions should be somehow physical. So for example, we have access to the input state, the output state, the time, of, uh, the time it evolves. Uh, sorry and, Tim, to interrupt you, but I think there are some connections with the yeah. projector. So maybe if you can just pause for one minute or so, so we can see if we sure. can fix them. Oh, sorry about that. It's a view. Uh, view screen. 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 Let's try it. Let's, let's see if it wants any. Yes. Yeah. Sorry for interruption, Tim. Please, please okay. continue. So, okay, shortly to shortly repeat. So we have some input, we have some black box, we have some output, we have a time we can adapt, and then we want to uh, measure the output state, get some data. And from the data, we want to um, learn the coefficients which define the Hamiltonian. Um, okay, and now, okay, it's called bosonic Hamiltonian learning. So we are in the continuous variable case or the bosonic system case, and uh, want to learn there the Hamiltonian or the coefficients. And of course, this is used, I mean, like this is a very fundamental task. We have some device or some experiment and uh, we don't know really what's going on. We know some structure, but we want to learn this. And I mean, in many other talks, we've already seen the CAT code or GKP code, which, um, and there, for example, we can 
um, characterize those uh, unitaries and also the bose hubbard model, for example. So, but before we um, um, look at the bosonic case, I will shortly um, recall um, the qubit, uh, uh, two qubit results, which um, are like very close to ours, but of course there are many others, um, but I just picked out those two. Um, one is about a standard quantum limit, which is uh, also by Daniel et al. And the other, by, the other one is the Heisenberg limit case, which is by Robert Hung et al. So there the task is that you have a qubit system, um, you have an Hamiltonian, you exp um, or one of their results is that you have a Hamiltonian and there's many qubit system um, and you express the Hamiltonian by a two body, uh, by, by Pauli uh, matrices more or less in a Pauli basis. And now you want to learn the coefficients there. And um, the standard quantum limit result uh, scales like this. You, so you have the precision epsilon to the minus two and uh, logarithmic in uh, M, which is the system size and delta the um, underlying probability. Um, so here's, I mean, one very important aspect is that you have only the system size logarithmically in M. And uh, so you kind of use the locality once assume like nearest neighbors, um, you assume on the Hamiltonian. Uh, in the case of the Heisenberg limit or the Heisenberg scaling, you have epsilon to the minus one. So this is um, called Heisenberg uh, scaling. But on the other side, you also have some like um, other parameters, for example, the time, the total or time you have to evolve the experiment is like um, epsilon minus one and logarithmically. Um, and at the same time, you have to interact with the evolution um, in very short time steps. So the time resolution is quite high. Um, there are also results showing that only under those assumptions can achieve the Heisenberg limit. On the other, other side, the standard quantum limit, which is scaling um, um, not that good in um, the total evolution time. So you need to learn the Hamiltonian, the time you need to learn the Hamiltonian. But here, for example, the, uh, the time you run the experiment is just a constant and the res resolution is poorly logarithmically in, in epsilon minus one. So the time steps you, after which you measure are much larger, um, which is like um, sometimes perhaps more physical because Perhaps you, you, your given um, experiment uh, has a like a lower limit on, on the, those parameters. Okay, so and and okay, and, and this is like the case we want to um, show for bosonic systems as well. Okay, so now for the in a bosonic system, um, we first choose a preparation as well here. So and this is the Korean state. So and this is just because. Um, of some nice properties we will see later, but also because Korean states are kind of simple to prepare uh, in these uh, systems. Uh, then we evolve the system, system by an Hamiltonian, for example, um, the bose hubbard model, and now the task would be to learn those coefficients, right? And here we have a maximal fixed time, but also some um, um, smaller time steps, uh, which scale like polylogarithmically later in epsilon, and last not, but not least, we want to measure um, the output state by a heterodyne measurement, which is given here, uh, locally defined. So it looks like a Korean state a little bit. Um, it is a POBM, so it's really a measurement. If you integrate over um, beta, and beta is in the complex plane, then you get back the identity up to a scaling. Important here, it's, it's now like uh, the output, um, if we measure the probability distribution we get is continuous. So the POVM is giving us a density function and we have to take care um, later. So, okay, now the one property we wanna use is the following. So the coherent states are eigenvectors of the annihilation operator. So we have this property. And by this one can show that if we apply the Hamiltonian um, onto the input state uh, with respect to the measurement, the POVM, one can show that this looks like G and G is a polynomial with some um, prefactor. And the coefficients in this polynomial directly relate to the coefficients of the model. So like the bose hubbard model. So the coefficients would be some uh, related to lambda. Okay, um, but what we see in the experiment is not this G. So 
Uh, what we really can measure is this probability or estimate this probability um, distribution. So now you see this is the um, evolved state, the measurement, this is our density. And if we could integrate over region, and, um, um, okay, this the squared is too much uh, in the complex plane. And here I'm restricting now to uh, J. So the, the measurement here is locally defined and just on site. You can also do edges and so on, but in the sake of simplicity, I choose just on uh, one side. And then you get the probability that your outcome is in this area uh, B um, is given by this, uh, this integral. So now for our algorithm, we choose, for example, this B beta, which is just the square until the point beta. Um, and then, oh, sorry. Um, we could estimate this, but this is still not giving us the first equation because then we have the derivative at zero, right? We have the directed the Hamiltonian and not the evolved state. If we would just follow this path by a finite difference scheme, we wouldn't achieve the scaling uh, we want. And this is already seen in the, uh, was already seen in the qubit case. Um, so what we do is some um, strategy similar to a qubit case, which is, that we approximate this uh, output probability function by a polynomial first by a Lee Robinson bound to have some um, local evolution. Then we tailor so we get a polynomial um, again up to some scaling, which we know, so it's not so important. And if, if we again differentiate uh, in T and beta, we get back this G. And the G is kind of the information we need to get the coefficients. Okay, but uh, now in practice, in practice again, um, we don't just uh, get these probabilities here. We really ne need to sample. So what we do is we just check in this box whether there's a point or not. So this is kind of the estimator at the end. And by Höfting's inequality, this shows us that we can estimate those points here. So for different alpha, beta, and t's. And now for different alpha, betas, and t's, so beta is defined here, alpha the input stage, t the time, um, we, int, uh, we, we sample for different points, estimate these points, and then interpolate um, um, by a Chebyshev interpolation. So we get this polynomial. And now we know um, by this interpolation scheme that this polynomial is close to this polynomial, okay, up to this factor, which we know. So we really know, okay, these polynomials are uh, close to each other up to some epsilon we can control. And now we want to connect this, uh, this polynomial to G, which is then done by Marcus Brother inequality, which is showing us that if these two are close, we know that the derivative of this is close to the derivative of this. And this is what we want. But now we have a, a problem because for this bosonic systems, um, Lee-Bromden bound and Taylor expansion does not exist always. So if we just take the bose hubbard model and try to Taylor expand, it's not converging. The problem is that the annihilation creation operators are unbound operators. If we, I mean, in a Taylor expansion, you have products of those, they, um, they um, um, just blow up the limit at the end. So it's not clear whether it's converging. So you shouldn't do this. The Robbins bound the same. Um, so in general, the Robbins and there are even counter examples by Isaac et al. showing that there are no existing Lee Robinson bounds or model where you don't have the existing Lee Robinson bounds. So, but there's hope by a, a result by Kuba Haga et al. showing that, for example, for the Bose Hubbard model, you can show some uh, Lee Robinson bound. And, and this is kind of our main technical um, contribution in this paper that we are able to give an assumption, which is more or less simple to show that there is a Lee Robinson bound. And the Lee Robinson bound uh, look like this. So you have some, um, some um, Markov, um, some semi-group uh, or some evolution and you approximate by an evolution which is locally defined and a cutoff. So we cut off at some energy and then it's a finite operator. So this is bounded. And for bounded operators, Taylor expansion, of course, converge. So for this operator, we can Taylor expand. 
And then by this early Bromelin bond, we can use the strategy I explained before. So now this assumption, which I haven't written down here, is a little bit technical. So for example, satisfied by the Bruce Hubbard model, any quadratic Hamiltonian uh, in annihilation creation operator or any polynomial in Ham uh, any polynomial polynomial defined Hamiltonian plus dissipation. The dissipation is this photon loss, which we know from the bosonic cut code, and there were already some talks about this. So if you add this dissipation to any polynomial Hamiltonian, um, you can enforce the Romanin bounds. So by this, you can kind of learn any um, any um, Hamiltonian um, defined like this. But of course, for the cut code, somehow the dissipation comes in by definition or by the construction of the code. But if you just have a Hamiltonian lying around, more or less, you will want to add this dissipation. And this, for example, we provide um, a throttle scheme here. Um, so we intersect this evolution small time step by this dissipation to enforce it. But in general, you just need the assumption for our Lee-Bromden bounds, and then you, you, you are safe to learn the, um, the Hamiltonian. Okay. Mm. So if you have this Lee-Bromden bound, we can prove the following, which is exactly what we want to achieve. So we can estimate the coefficients in the Hamiltonians. So like the lambda mu's and u's in the bose hubbard model. And um, then um, up to a precision epsilon with some underlying probability coming from the, like the, the probabilistic um, nature of quantum physics. Um, and we need the standard quantum limit. So the total evolution time epsilon minus two and logarithmically in the number of modes of the system size. Um, and then the, to the maximal time we need is constant and the resolution time so the, the smaller time step we need for our interpolation scheme is then polylogarithmically in epsilon for minus one. Okay, um, um, here I just wanna uh, remark another result which came out at the same time as ours, which is about the Heisenberg um, scaling. So for the booth hubbard model, there's also like in another paper by uh, Yu Tong, um, giving the Heisenberg scaling with um, unfortunate uh, resolution, which depends on the system size, um, but um, also achieving the Heisenberg limit. And uh, okay, this, this results for the standard quantum limit. Um, okay, then, okay. Thank you for your attention and feel free to ask questions. All right, thanks, Tim. Uh, do you, do you have any questions from the audience? I think there's one down no, there. Yeah. Yes, thank you for a nice talk. Perhaps an Eve question was what do you mean with uh, a polynomially defined Hamiltonian? Ah, sorry. So it's kind of, um, okay, if we go, for example, back to the Bose Harvard model, it's kind of, I mean, the polynomial in AI AJ. So we just, I mean, if you take a poly, uh, poly, multivariate polynomial and the inputs are more or less the annihilation duration operators defined on different modes. So this is a polynomial. And for example, the quadratic one, the Gaussians are somehow polynomials in annihilation creation operators. I see. So basically any Hamiltonian uses creation and annihilation operators that has any like efficient description is actually polynomial defined then, I guess. Or, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, one needs to be a little bit careful because if you go to higher power polynomials, it's not clear whether the Hamiltonian is always defined. So then another assumption that this Hamiltonian is kind of physical, so it's defined or well-defined as needed, but it's kind of, yeah, physical. I see, thanks. Thanks for the talk. So I have one question for the estimated parameters that you obtain. So they are dependent on the energy that you fix from... Mm -hmm. So um, somehow you can, if, if you take the limit, if you want the full energy limit, so how, how it behaves, uh, mm -hmm. does it affect a lot or not? Some, or I not? mean, somehow the, in one another something which I skipped is that, I mean, okay, not really skipped. Um, these coefficients are somehow bounded. So the absolute value is like finite. Um, so if I scale this to infinity, of course, the bounds would blow up. And the energy I cut off is more like a mathematical tool during proof. 
So this um, this cutoff I um, mentioned shortly in the hourly Robinson bound. So this one is chosen in the in the in the proof more or less. So this M is more or less fixed that we know okay, it's approximating well. But I mean I could also write down the Lee Robinson bound uh, without the M. So then there's still a Lee Robinson bound. It would more be a problem for the Taylor expansion, but um, it's kind of a trade-off at the end. But like I mean, for the fixed preparation for 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 fixed um, like coefficients, um, there's no energy constraint. Thanks. So um, okay, the first question is: uh, uh, your results holds just for Bose Albert Hamiltonian, or also for more general uh, Hamiltonian? I mean, for any quadratic Hamiltonian, and I mean, if you add dissipation, you can do any polynomial. Okay. So and um, M is the number of modes, right? Exactly. Okay. M is the number of modes, so it's somehow the system size. Okay. And um, I would expect that uh, the total uh, time required uh, on the, your final result will depend on also on uh, the total number of coefficients that you have to learn, right? Yeah, uh, exactly. Why yeah. that, that is I mean, it's kind of, uh, I mean, if you, for example, assume to be nearest neighbor, which is the case for the Bose Harvard and you're on the lattice, for example. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, then it's like the system size. It depends on the system size, like logarithmically in M. This is where the logarithmically in M comes in. So, oh, of course, if you now do like K local, I mean, we are not, we're doing Lee Robinson bound for K local Hamiltonian, but not the learning, but uh, we expect it works the, in the same way. Um, then it would depend on locality. Of course, if you have now um, very, very large um, K local Hamiltonian, so defined in large regions, um, this depends on this region. And um, yeah, okay, but but the, the system size coming in here is only this logarithmic MM. There's no number of um, terms coming up again. I mean, in the post-processing task, of course, you have to calculate all the data, but um, for the measurement, you do some parallel schemes to have this logarithmic MM. Okay, I see. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Are there any questions? Oh, if not, then I can ask one. So uh, you mentioned these uh, works that achieve a Heisenberg scaling, mm -hmm. but as far as I know, they all only can do like um, closed system evolutions. They cannot, let's say, learn dissipation, the dissipative terms as well with Heisenberg scaling. Uh, do you think that's that's possible or like... Uh, for the Heisenberg or for powers? Yeah, like get a Heisenberg scaling and allow for dissipative uh, terms in your evolution. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, we're working on something using dissipation to achieve the Heisenberg scaling without. Um, I mean, I, I mentioned shortly the result by Yu Tong, where, okay, perhaps I go back to the uh, qubit case. Um, so, I mean, uh, the, like the bosonic learning results for the Heisenberg scaling um, has a, an M here. Which is like like system size dependent, and by by some using dissipation, you can erase this m there that you have somehow a similar result for the qubit case. Um, but I'm not sure about Heisenberg scaling for Lin Blandins. I mean, about our scheme, I, I think it should work. Uh, it's more like um, tedious to do it, <laughs> but uh, should work. But because we also have the problems bound in for the um, Lin Blandins and stuff. Like this. Thanks. Uh, so yeah, let's thank uh, Tim again and uh...